Time now for Inside Utah Politics. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Glenn Mills. It is time to go Inside Utah Politics. We do begin this morning with Thomas Wright, President and CEO of Summit Sotheby's Realty. He's here to dig into Utah's wild real estate market, and that might be putting it mildly, Thomas, wild. <laughs> It is wild, it's fast paced, it's, uh, man, it's dynamic yeah. and it's, it's really hard to understand. So I'm glad we're here to talk about it. Yeah, something we haven't experienced before, unprecedented, and I really can't even believe we're at this point, to be honest with you, but here we are. So let's dig into it. What's your current assessment of where we sit right now? Well, there's really low standing inventory. And I emphasize the word standing inventory because you can't break all the sales records that we've had if there's no inventory. So right now, uh, it just doesn't stay on the market very long. We have rapidly escalating median prices. Yeah, median let, being, let's get into that yeah. because we, you see the graphic there on the screen. Talk about what has happened over the last two years there. Well, what's happening is prices are escalating really quickly and people are being priced out of the market. And that's a problem for two reasons. One, we're not gonna have the workforce we need to continue the growth rate that we have in the state of Utah. And secondly, our kids are gonna have a hard time affording housing in the state of Utah. So look at the median and the average prices, you know, there it is, 467,000, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, pr pretty insane. Okay, how did we get here? Well, before the pandemic, we had a housing shortage. We've known that we've had a housing shortage for a long time. Mm -hmm. The pandemic froze construction, adding to the new inventory coming onto the market in a slower pace, and then demand just skyrocketed. So you had little supply already, then you had even less because of the pandemic, and then you had accelerated demand. And mm -hmm. now look, you see there in February, that's the lowest inventory, standing inventory month we've had. Um, it's starting to climb a little bit, but I think that climb is really just aspirational sellers who think, hey, if I can get that price for my house, we might as well give it a try. I mean, we're seeing that. We're, we're seeing listings over a million dollars that shouldn't be anywhere near that. Is, that. is that what's happening? People are just saying, hey, if I can get that, we'll go for it. If not, we'll just stay here. Well, when there's such a run on housing and interest rates are so low, people then look and say, hey, what are my options? I've got to have housing if I want to mm -hmm. live here. So then prices start to escalate. And obviously people look and they say, hey, if I can get this price for my home, then I would sell and I would figure right. out an alternative. So that's why I think the inventory is starting to come up just a little bit. But look, Glenn, the housing you see coming on the market right now is, was started probably two or two and a half years ago. So if we want to solve this housing shortage, this crisis that we have in the state of Utah, we've got to figure out how to build more, more quickly, and we've got mm -hmm. to have more housing stock. Otherwise, our kids are going to have a hard time staying here, and we're going to have a hard time sustaining the growth that maybe we wanted, maybe we didn't, but it found us. Okay, uh, a couple, uh, so much to dig into there. Uh, first off, you talk about building. Uh, there's a subdivision across the street for where I'm at now. My, my subdivision is a newer one. It was finished last year. Uh, but this one across the street, they've been trying to develop it for a long time, and people have contracts on homes over a year now, and they haven't even started yet. Yeah, What's going I, on? I don't know about that one in particular, but mm -hmm. you know, it takes a long time to get a housing project approved. And, you know, it's got to go through planning and zoning and city council approval sometimes. I mean, there's, there's a process and it takes time. And that's why I reiterate the fact that we have a shortage right now is a problem because even if we started building right now really quickly, we'd still be two years out with the processes that we have in mm -hmm. place. We need to look at seriously, mm -hmm. uh, how do we trim that process back how do we help uh, get more housing built more quickly uh, so that we can catch up to the current demand? Because let me tell you, Glenn, it's heartbreaking to see people make five, 10 offers on homes, 50, 100,000 over asking price. They can't get into the home. Mm -hmm. They can't find a place to live. There's a serious impact on our children and on our society when, when we find yeah. ourselves in this situation. I, I know it's frustrating, and I, I'm sure some get to the point where they just give up and, and have to move on. When you talk about uh, getting more building and, and more housing available, what are the solutions to that? Well, I'm always careful about using the word density because when people use the word density, they immediately think of an apartment building in their neighborhood. But density can mean more single family detached housing, just more of it on smaller lots so that we can, we can figure out a way to build our way out of this, this crisis that we find ourselves in. We've got to think out of the box. We've got to think of ways to find people uh, to get them into housing mm -hmm. and we need to incentivize cities to step up to the plate on figuring it out because right now it's, it's a local municipality decision 
and not everybody wants more density in their community. It's right. called NIMBYism, not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. We all have been guilty of it, and we've got to start changing that the narrative on density, and we've got to start looking at the not in my backyard mentality and saying, do we want our kids to be able to stay here, and do we, do we want the people that are here to have housing? Um, where do you see this going next? I, I hear the question all the time, is this a bubble? Is it going to burst? But if we're talking truly an inventory problem, that seems to me that this isn't a bubble. I, I, do, I personally don't believe there's a bubble. Uh, I have this litmus test I apply that has 10 criteria of whether you're in a housing bubble or not. It's something I track closely. Um, only a couple of the signs are there. There's really not a housing bubble. I think prices will continue to escalate as long as demand stays as high as it is and supply stays as low as it is. I'm hopeful that some of the building material costs, lumber and others have started to come back down, that that mm -hmm. will help alleviate some of the pressure on pricing. But when you have as much demand as you have on housing right now, prices are gonna continue to go up. Yeah. I mean, Glenn, I've seen 30, 40 offers on one property. Um, you know, it's seven or eight of those all cash, waiving appraisal contingencies. How does the first time home buyer that saved 10% that's working a job and wants a 30 year mortgage ever going to compete with that? Well, th that's a good question and I'm going to pose it to you because that's on my mind often as well. It's, it's, an on it's a question we have to ask and that's why I get back to, okay, we've got a shortage of supply. We have a supply problem. We've got to increase the supply and the way you do that is by allowing it to happen more quickly and by allowing builders to get out there and build more housing stock. I, 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 look, I'm a Utah. I, I, I remember what Utah was like before all this growth, and, and I'm, I know there's a lot of people out there that maybe didn't ask for this growth or didn't want it, but it found us and it's here. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna see some long-term and short-term consequences if we don't figure this out. I wanna be really clear, we cannot continue to approve new housing stock and build it on the same trajectory that we've been doing that if we want to solve this affordable and attainable mm -hmm. housing crisis that we have in the state of Utah. Oh. As you know, and we all know, we live in a valley, though. In a valley, there's only so much land to go around. So do we need to also start focusing our attention on, you know, moving beyond the Salt Lake Valley, even further south of Utah County? Yeah, the housing crisis uh, for, is in all 29 counties in the state of Utah. Uh, I've talked to people in eastern Utah, southern Utah, northern, all parts of rural Utah. Their children leave those communities because they cannot find attainable and affordable housing. So this isn't just a Wasatch Front problem. Of course, that's where we see a lot of the activity in the state because two thirds of our population lives along the Wasatch Front. But it is not just a Wasatch Front problem. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see those rural communities get economic development where people move there, but we're still going to have the same problem. No company is gonna move to rural Utah or anywhere where there's not workforce and workforce can't be there if there isn't housing. So this isn't just a housing problem. There's a major mm -hmm. overlap with our economic growth and the sustainability of our economy. You, you mentioned the next generation. Uh, where are they going to live? How are they going to afford it? Are you seeing any trends there? Like, are you starting to see maybe brothers teaming up and, and buying a home? You know, multiple families in one home. Yeah, I actually just read a report on this where they are teaming up and people are living, uh, multiple families living in one household. And, and I, I get that that's the solution, but there's, there's, there's challenges with that. Uh, children don't reach their full potential as well in that scenario as they do in a, in a single family or in a single dwelling home with their own mm -hmm. family. So this is why I'm so concerned about it. Uh, this is not just about the economic feasibility of our long-term success in Utah. It's about the quality of life and the impact it has on our children that's very untold and unseen for a really long time. Mm -hmm. We owe it to our children to solve this problem and to have people have housing where they can reach their God-given potential. Okay, um, you've already mentioned, you've seen some instances where there's 40 officers, obviously, uh, 40 offers. Obviously only one person or one offer gets that. That leaves 39 out. We're seeing that really in, in many situations. So you're a professional here uh, when it comes to buying and selling homes. What do buyers need to know right now about the market conditions and how they can make themselves uh, more appealing to a seller? Well, I mean, buyers, like I said before, that are more traditional, that have saved a down payment and that are buying for their home need to make the case strongly about the fact that they've lived here and why they're buying the home. Um, you need to you know, make sure you're compliant with the fair housing guidelines and everything associated with that. 
but you're competing against institutional investors, you're competing against 1031 exchanges, which just means uh, real estate investors are rolling the profits from another project into another real estate project. You've gotta really personalize the process. A good realtor can help you do that, whether it's in my company or any of the others. A good realtor can help you make that happen. Uh, but get ahead of the lending process, how you're mm -hmm. gonna finance the home, and be really on top of that, because if you're not, you're gonna have a really hard time competing in this multiple offer climate. And we're gonna get more into the financing side of it uh, after the break. Thanks so much for your time. We appreciate your insight. A big crisis we have on our hands here. Thanks, Glenn. You're watching Inside Utah Politics. Welcome back. We continue our conversation on Utah's real estate market from the perspective of getting a loan. Corby Coy is a branch manager with Academy Mortgage. Corby, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, wild market. We talked a little bit about it in the uh, first segment of the show. Now bringing you in to focus specifically on the mortgage perspective. Uh, when you take a look and assess what's happening now, what are you seeing and what are you doing? You know, we're seeing um, a a shortage of homes, um, putting it candidly. Um, a lot of buyers wanting to buy a small number of homes that are available for sale. Um, so we're seeing competition that we haven't seen in years past. Um, you know, rates are low, which is helpful, mm -hmm. um, but definitely a supply and demand issue. Yeah, we we'll want to get into the rates a little bit more in, in a bit, but how would you compare what you are seeing now from your work when compared to markets in the past? You know, we're seeing buyers having to be creative um, mm -hmm. with their offers. Um, patience and perseverance are key. Um, we're seeing people um, write offers that maybe are above asking price or um, have some sort of perks to the sellers that um, in previous years wouldn't have been necessary, for sure. And, and what's your advice to a buyer in that situation having to do that? Yeah, my advice, you have the age old advice, of course, which is, um, you know, keep your credit scores high by paying payments on time monthly and making sure that you're not over utilizing credit. Um, you have your keep your monthly obligations low and save for a down payment. Those are applicable in any industry. Um, but in this specific market, um, I would say find a loan officer you trust. There are plenty of good ones out there. And um, get pre-qualified early. Be ready to hit the ground running. In order to have your offer even considered, um, you have to be well ahead of the process on qualification. Mm -hmm. Talk about what goes through the pre-qualification process. Uh, what do buyers need to know about that? And how you just mentioned, you know, you're not just going in at the list price, you're having to go above that. So how do you factor all of that in when you're going through the pre-qual process? Yeah, we can't ever really anticipate how the offers are going to shake out, of course. So um, anecdotally, I had a colleague who recently wrote um, 22 offers before she finally had one accepted for a set of buyers. And so we, on our end, sort of wait and see how the offer shakes out. Um, which is why having buyers save for down payment or possibly having an available co-signer mm -hmm. or an available gift from a family member or employer um, really helps sort of, you know, massage those offers out when they all, you know, get finalized. Right. So let's say someone qualifies for up to 400000 Sure. Obviously, then they have to have that in mind, but go after something lower knowing they're gonna have to bump up that list price. Is that what you're advising at I this time? I think it's, yeah, fair advice so as mm -hmm. to not have their offers be futile. Um, stay underneath what your maximum price range, you know, that your loan officer has told you. Mm -hmm. um, stay beneath that so that you have some bargaining room. Okay, makes sense. Uh, you made mention of, you know, buyers putting in 22 offers before they, they get one finally. What's your advice for someone to, to stick with it for that because that has to be frustrating and I imagine many people maybe after the 10th are saying I just I can't do it anymore. Yeah I, I can imagine it, it probably feels very daunting. Um, my advice is to be patient and stick with it. I am seeing that eventually most well-qualified home buyers are finding a home. Um, it's, it's requiring some flexibility, some creativity, um, but I am finding that ultimately most of them 
mm -hmm. do go under contract. So, so Corby, you talk about uh, having to be flexible. What are lenders doing? Because I imagine they have to do that as well. We are, we're having to stay nimble as well and keep our closing times very short. Um, sellers have the upper hand and want to be able to close as quickly as possible. And so we're having to um, stay within those confines. We're also having to stay abreast of programs that are available, um, first time home buyer programs mm -hmm. and various other things that can work for buyers who need to use their cash maybe to make up an appraisal gap. Um, we are trying to you know, have some low or no down payment yeah. options. L let's dig into that a little bit more because that's who I feel for the most in this situation we're dealing with right now as a first time home buyer. Uh, so what do they need to know? Yeah, there are programs that exist and are good programs, um, easy to use for low and no down payment first time home buyers. Um, an important point of that too, I think they get, they're tailored for first time home buyers, but worth mentioning is that most first time home buyer programs actually define a first time home buyer as someone who hasn't owned a home in the previous three years. So oh. maybe hmm. you've had a divorce or a job transfer, you know, maybe life has thrown you a curveball. Um, if you haven't owned a home in the last three years, you very well may qualify for a first time home buyer loan. Okay, very interesting. Uh, let's get back to the interest rates. You mentioned those, historic lows. Uh, I remember my first mortgage was somewhere around uh, 8% and my parents' generation was looking at that saying, wow, that's low. But boy, you look at it now and it's unbelievable where it's at. But that really plays a role in this situation as well. So first start off with where are we seeing rates at this time? Yeah, rates are exactly as you said, at historic, you know, near or at historic lows. Um, we're seeing you know, wh what that's doing, to answer your question, it's helping people to qualify for more, which mm -hmm. is very helpful in this market. With home prices so high, um, the lower the rate is, the lower your payment, and it's giving people a little bit of edge there where they can, you know, qualify for a little bit more home. Um, as rates increase, a good rule of thumb, um, I have a colleague up at our Hillfield office, Brett Mills, a little shout out there. Um, <laughs> who, no um, relation. <laughs> no, yeah, no, <laughs> truly, <laughs> um, who succinctly, um, stated recently that a 1% increase in rates reduces the amount that you can qualify for by 10%. Wow. So rates are helping people, mm -hmm. even though prices are high, those low rates really are um, you know, helping people at least to get their foot in the door. Yeah, that's critical when you look at a market like now. Okay, so you've already done this, but I just wanna summarize again, tips for prospective buyers to improve their chances, to make their uh, offer look more attractive. Yeah. Um, again, keep your credit scores high, keep your monthly mortgage, or excuse me, monthly obligations low. Um, find a loan officer that you trust and get pre-qualified early. Absolutely use a realtor. In this market in particular, um, navigating the complexities of this market would be nearly impossible without an agent. And then just be flexible, be patient, stay nimble. Um, keep your spirits up. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I am seeing most people qualify for something ultimately. Okay, that's, uh, that's a good note to end on because it can give people some hope who otherwise may not have it in, in this market. Definitely. Uh, again, Corby Coy with Academy Mortgage, appreciate your time. Thanks, Thanks for being for here. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.